super excited to uh, talk to you about this topic of security champions. Share a little bit about my journey, kind of how what, what I've experienced in running security champions programs. <clears throat> a little bit about me. So I'm the chief security officer and co-founder of Security Journey. And I've been in the world of security for 25 plus years and had a chance to do a lot of different things in, in my time. Spent 10 years at Cisco. I'll tell you some more of that story as we go forward because some of that story was running the security advocates at Cisco. And I'm also the co-lead of the OWASP Triangle chapter. That's in Raleigh, North Carolina, which is uh, where my home base is. So I've got a podcast called the Application Security Podcast. I know it's not the best marketing name, but you do understand exactly what we're gonna talk about on there. So we've done about 200 episodes so far, interviewed lots of people that are even speaking at this conference and uh, understand kind of what makes them tick and uh, what makes them be successful. I'm also a big fan of Twitter, so feel free to reach out to me there as well. And uh, just one, one quick plug. Um, so my company, Security Journey, we uh, have a deal with OWASP where if you're an OWASP member, you can uh, get access to a version of our product that's included with your OWASP, OWASP membership. So all, we, we use a lot of OWASP sources, as you could imagine, <laughs> for our content. And so we, we provide all that content back to OWASP members through that. So you can check that out as well, but you have to be an OWASP member to get access to that. So here's the agenda that I have for us today. I'm gonna, on the first three, I'm just gonna spend a real short amount of time and I'm gonna spend the bulk of my time on what I'm calling the security champion framework. But before we get there, I want to uh, talk about what I see as the challenges that exist without champions. I wanna then talk about the need for champions and the goal that I see, and then the value proposition, what you'll get out of doing this. And then, like I said, we'll talk about the framework and I'll show you how the framework kind of comes together. But First, help me understand who I'm talking to in the room here. So if you have an existing Security Champions program right now, raise your hand, let me see. Okay, good number of people. Okay, if you're, if you're getting ready to start a, a new program and you're here to kind of try to figure out some things you can do, raise your hand, let me see if we got any of those folks, okay. And if you hate Security Champions programs, please, and I'm doing this for my friend Izar in the back here who is happily, we've had many debates about um, security champions pro versus con. So um, yeah, just had to throw that in for him. So that, that's helpful for me though to, to understand where folks are coming from. So let, let's talk for a second about what life looks like if we don't have security champions. Think of all the different pieces of your application security program, all the different things that you have to do. If you don't have security champions, security has to be responsible for, for dealing with all of these things. Yeah, you could say, well, the, the, we're going to make developers responsible for them. But if you have a world where developers don't know that much about security yet, these things are falling back on you as a security team. And so look at that. I mean, you've got security user stories. You've got results from all the different types of tools, the four letter and three letter tools from SCA to SAST and DAST and CVA. You got security tests, broken certs, pen test results, security chaos engineering experiment failures, all of these things. If we don't have champions dispersed throughout the business to help us deal with these things, then we as security have to deal with them ourselves. And so just a, a little bit about my, um, kind of my champion origin story. So like I said, I was at Cisco for about 11 years and uh, six of those years were being part of the central security team that was focused on securing all of Cisco's products. And like with a lot of security advocates, security champion programs, the Cisco one went through a number of ups and up and down. And so what would happen and what happened with 1.0, 2.0, 3.0, I was responsible for the 3.0 instance of it. But with 1.0 and 2.0, someone would take over the program. They would get excited about it. The program would go up, they'd get lots of people. And then what would happen? The person would leave, <laughs> they'd go take another job and then it would fall back down to almost nothing. And then at Cisco, the second, second, another person that I worked with on my team kind of took it, drove it up, and then he left. And we had some attrition in the overall approach. And then I picked it up with 3.0, and I picked it up with really a ragtag group of, uh, of individuals. I had about 20 people left at that point. And these people love security. They were developers, testers, you know, in some of the different technical roles across the different business units. And they love security enough to, to step forward and be a part of what, what I was continuing to do. But I mean, in those early days, I, Cisco is, is in San Jose, California, has about 35 buildings. I literally went to San Jose on a trip. I made a list of people that I wanted to try to get to become advocates. 
and I went cube to cube and I literally knocked on people's cube walls and said, hi, I'm Chris, I'm starting the Security Advocates again and we need you to be a part of it. You know, and a lot of people gave me a lot of weird looks like why is this, the, why is there a solicitor in the building? Uh, I'm like, I have a badge, you know, I work here as well. Uh, but that was how I really jump started it and, and got it going again. And so all of that to say, what I'm gonna share with you in this framework, is based on my real life experience and experiences I've learned from, you know, hearing from other people, other people that I know that run these types of programs. So um, most of us probably know this already, but when I think about a champion, what I'm really looking for is that one spark, that one little spark of interest about security. If I can get that spark, then I can pour into that person and we as a program can pour into that person to help them really grow and, and, and become excited about security. If I have somebody who's just like, eh, they're making me do this, it just never works out as well for that person because they don't have any interest or any passion in what's happening. And then security community for me, it's, you know, let's bring together this virtual team of people from across the business in many different roles. I'm gonna to refer to these folks going forward as product adjacent. Okay, so my, everybody who is anywhere near the product is product adjacent. So from the developers, the testers, the SREs, the program managers, the product managers, everybody, they're all product adjacent. And so I want them all to have visibility and, and a role in what we're doing as a security community. Yeah, sure. Yes, definitely. Yeah, good question. Yeah, so when I, when I in, in the program, the way I describe doing this and the way I think is the best way to do it, it, it you, ha you should have more than just developers. Because at the end of the day, everyone who's in that product adjacent category, we're all responsible for the security of the product. We just have different roles. And when you get a product manager who, who understands the, the risk and the threats and the needs for security, they're never going to fight you again. On, on adding security focused user stories. They're gonna be an advocate for it in the planning process. They're gonna be like, oh, whoa, whoa, we gotta set some time aside here in these next sprints to deal with these security user stories because we got some functionality we gotta get you know, re-added in, so yeah. Um, but just so you know this, I mean, my, what I've put forth in this framework, it's descriptive, it's not always prescriptive. So not everything that I say today is gonna to be applicable in what you're doing in, in your Champions program, but I'm just gonna throw out everything I know and all the experiences that I've had and, and, and you can pick and choose which ones you think are gonna work best for you. So when I think about the successful champion, few different, three, few different things that I, I'm hoping are going to be developed in that individual. So the first one is foundational knowledge. Right? I, need, I need my champions to have a basic understanding of product and application security, all the way down to really the literal basics, the, thing, the things that we think of as basics. You know, the CIA triad, yeah, it's, it's in every certification, who knows why, but like even the basic kind of things like that, I want everybody, I want people to know what is authentication, what is authorization, what are these basic building blocks, and then, because then I can build on top of that. Now, I talked about that spark of passion already. That's, that's crucial. If they don't have that spark, it's really tough to, to, to take somebody on a long-term journey where they're gonna really dive in and get into this. I want them to understand the attacks that, that the things they build are gonna be going up against. I also want them to acknowledge, which this isn't as much of a challenge now as it used to be, but I, I want them to, to realize what I build gets pushed into production and then attackers hammer it all day long, trying to find a way into it. You know? and, and so like I said, that's, that's been a transition over time. And I also want them to know how to utilize tools and processes that we have. I want them to be enablers that can, that can help those around them be, be, use the tools, interpret the results. Once again, I'm trying to funnel some of, the, some of the things that normally would go to a security team if we don't have champions. I want them to knock some of those things off for us because I think that's really the only way we scale. Okay, I don't know about you, but every time, oh yeah, question. I, I think of those as really two separate things. So they, that, those are more kind of the general security awareness things that we have to do for the whole population. For me, security champions are really more focused on engineering, building, developing. Now it doesn't mean that all the things I'm describing here, you can use as a general awareness thing as well. I just come at this from more of an engineering, developing, developer kind of focus, just because I've been living in AppSec for you know the last 10 years. 
But these principles you'll find, you can apply these to a lot of different online community approaches. Okay, so I don't know about you, but every year I download the BSIM report for one reason, because I want to know what this stat is and how much it's changed. And I, I literally don't read anything else in it. That's probably terrible to say on, on video, but that's okay. <laughs> but I do love this statistic. But you know, this is a very misleading statistic. Have any idea why this is misleading? Because if you're a BSIM member and you're willing to pay a big chunk of money to be part of an organization where you get assessed and checked against all 150 other organizations, you already take security seriously. So my, my kind of, I guess my hypothesis when I look at this number is this is for BSIM members. What is it for, the, for people that aren't part of BSIM? It can't be the same and it can't be less. Is it double? Is it four times more than this? I don't know. But these people are the ones that take security really seriously enough to pay for it. And that's the, that's the statistic that comes out of it, the 135, 135 developers for every one security person. But the, no matter what the actual number is, this paints the picture of why we have to have champions. Because you're not going to build a security team big enough to keep up with your development population. I mean, I've, I've not yet seen it anywhere where there is a one-to-one -one or a two-to-one -to -one relationship between, uh, between the, the security team and the developers that exist. So I asked a, a couple of my friends that run programs in different parts of uh, the, the technological industry space. And I got this interesting response because I, 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 want, I asked one of my friends that uh, is, at a, is an AppSec director, I'll say at a large company, that's as close as I can get. And I said, uh, you know, can I, can I talk about what you're doing? Can I use you as an example? He's like, no. <laughs> I was like, oh, wow, I thought the program was going, going well for you. And this is what he said. First of all, the, you know, their Champions program is not something he wants to talk about, but he, this, catch this next part. I've heard a common theme that Champions programs aren't working well in many companies this past year, that Champions aren't being allocated enough time to really take on the role, resulting in miss, missed expectations. And this is really the root of, if there is a, a problem with a Champions program, this is the one that gets you every time, is the people who are going to need, you're asking to be Champions, are not getting the support they need from their management structure to do the champion things you're asking them to do. And so this is one that we have to solve. If you're gonna have a successful champions program, you have to solve this. You cannot, you cannot have this be, be kind of over the heads of your champions. And, and I'll give you a specific example where I've seen this cause a lot of pain. So in a past program, I had some people I had a stage in this program where I didn't have the necessary buy-ins from everybody. And so I had a couple of developers that were champions that were part of the program that went rogue. And what I mean by went rogue is their manager said, no, you don't, I need you to do these other things. And they, they told their manager, screw you, I'm gonna be a champion because they said I can be a champion in the program. HR was involved, I got, they, I got called into the middle of it. It was not a pretty thing, it was not a pretty sight. And so I learned something from this, you're gonna see in the framework that's gonna come out that's gonna solve that. But, but this is our biggest challenge that we have to be ready to understand how we're gonna deal with it. All right, don't fall out of your seat on this one, okay? Anybody? Because this is a pie in the sky goal I have right now. Not the first part. Product adjacent is security force multipliers. I see that as a real thing that we can do, a real goal we can go after. Getting my product managers to be an advocate for security, my developers, my SREs, my QA people, my program managers, everybody seeing the value proposition and seeing themselves as being part of the solution. I think that's a, that's an, it's not an easy goal, but it's not insurmountable. I really want to see one security champion for every eight developers inside of a company. This is the part where you can fall out of your chair. Because I mean, think about how big your organization is. Think in your own brain right now. How many developers do I have? And if I had one champion for every eight of them, how, how, how big would my program be? I helped you because I looked at a couple of different examples. I went to uh, the best um, social engineering tool on the, on the internet today, LinkedIn Sales Navigator. Because <laughs> they, they have more data about companies than you, you could believe. And so I, I left who these people are. It doesn't matter who the, who the actual companies are, but LinkedIn Sales Navigator lets me see the company and then the number of 
employees and then the number of, you know, size of their engineering team. And then I can, I can take a guess as, as far as how big the software engineers with some other data there. And so take a look at, at a, just kind of how this breaks down. Large online realtor, retailer, 70,000 people. We're guessing 40,000 software engineers, guessing 300 people part of the security team, 5,000 champions. So when you start to get to big size companies, that one to eight really turns into a big number. But it's not as scary if you look at, you know, like a ride sharing company has about 4,800 in engineering, 22 on, this, on the security team, and that and one to eight ratio gets us to 375 from our number of champions. Insurance company, um, 52 champions as a result of their size of their team. Automaker, 313. So it's really only when you get to the big, really big size companies where the one to eight starts to go, oh, it's getting, that's getting to be like a really gigantic uh, program that needs a number of smaller programs in between. So here's a phased approach that I've seen for security champions programs. And I see a lot of, um, a lot of programs go through this same type of, of progression. And so they start with this group of, of diehard, passionate people that are at the core, that they start small. It's like a grassroots effort. Maybe management executives don't even know that it's happening when it initially kicks off. And then they go to this second phase. And the phase in the middle is the one I hate. I wish we could just jump over this one. The middle phase is the security voluntold phase, where a, a decree go, comes out from somebody that says, we're gonna have a two security champions for every product in our company. And then some of those teams, this is what happens. Okay, let's see, uh, you and you, you're the champions, go. You're gonna, you're gonna be great. But the, the challenge is, that I don't know if you and you are passionate about security, if you've got that little spark. Because if you don't have that spark, you're going to be like, oh, this sucks, more work I got to do, you know? I got to stack on top of my existing day job. So I don't love the voluntold phase, but I've seen it happen so many times. It's, it's a natural progression as far as trying to grow and scale a champion's program, especially at larger companies. Now, the third phase there, the security volunteers, this is where I want to get us to. And this is where I got the Cisco program to. I went from knocking on cube walls, like a, I don't know, I don't even know how to describe it, like something that people had never seen before in the building, to a couple of short years later, I had people chasing me trying to get into the program. People saying, oh, I want to be part of that. Because you know what? They started to see the value proposition. They started to see the benefits that we were providing to our champions. And they said, I want to be part of that. And that was a fun stage because then I could set requirements and I could say, oh, you want to be a champion, huh? Well, you got to reach a certain level in our education program. Then we can talk. I could set some other, I could set some, some more deeper requirements on it. So one of, one of the biggest, biggest problems we have as people who are running champions programs is we always think about the champions program is for us. We're the security team. What are we getting out of this? And I'm gonna challenge you today to say, flip that table upside down because this is not about us. This is about what are we gonna do for the people who are gonna be champions in our program? How are we gonna provide them value so they will chase you down and say, I wanna be in this. I see the value in this thing. So advanced training, knowledge and degrees, exclusive learning events, specific acknowledgement and recognition for them doing a good job. Uh, having exposure to management and executives as a result of good things they're doing as a champion. Being able to collaborate with different people from across the business and, and uh, meet different people, different security champions. You know, and if you're in a big company, that level of networking can end up getting you a promotion and a new job in a different business unit. And also that kind of career advancement or that pivot into security. But really it is about thinking about what's in it for them, not what's in it for you as security. That's the key here. But you're gonna get something out of it, right? Us as, as the security team, um, we're going to get resources without headcount, and we all are going to love that because we know we're not going to grow our team to be the size that we really want it to be to serve every piece of the business. Employees are going to be happier that are a part of this. You're going to have a group of security coaches embedded across the business. There's going to be a return on investment. You're going to have industry visibility. If you get to a certain point, people think you can get out and go to conferences and talk about your champions program. And then everybody's like, ooh, that company really takes security seriously. Look at, look at the, what they're doing with the Champions program. They're really focused on making every product secure inside of their portfolio. That's a powerful thing to take away. Okay, so all of that is the preamble to, this is what I call the Security Champion Framework. And so I've broken this down into five different categories. 
of planning, marketing, people, execution, and measurement. And then under those, I've got some sub areas. And what I'm doing with this framework is I'm giving you a number of categories and then a series between zero and three where you can look at this and say, here's where I am now and here's where I'm trying to go. And I'll tell you, this isn't perfect at this point. Like I need a lot more people in the industry and those that are running programs to, to take a look at what I've come up with and provide feedback. And that's something I'm gonna do with this in the next couple of months is try to, try to really flesh it out with a lot more data. But let's jump in. This is, this is kind of from my perspective. So the first one, strategy. What do you want them to do? What are we trying to do with this Champions program? What are the, what's the big picture goal? Everybody wants a vision. Everybody wants something to aim towards, right? Don't just have a Champions program and, and say, oh, we're gonna do monthly meetings. That's our goal. No, that's not a goal. That's a task. That's something I'll list on your task thing. Like, what are we trying to do? Are we trying to change the way we approach security inside this company? I don't know, what, it, what is it? But figure out what it is. And you're gonna see with each of these uh, individual framework categories, Level zero is gonna be you're not doing it. So like in this case, you know, you don't even have a program. So you're a zero from a strategy perspective. But you're a level one if you're defining and publicizing your program objective. So people know what are we trying to do? What is our shared, what are we aiming at? What are we working towards? Because being able to communicate that with everybody really helps them to, to understand what are we all trying to do together. Level two, you've got yearly goals for your community. Okay, that's something that I did that was very successful. Every year I set a new set of goals and I sent them out to everybody that was a champion. And they had to acknowledge the fact that here, this was our shared goals for the next year. Defining and prioritizing that program vision and then providing an acceptance and tracking tool for the goals, level two. I wanna be able to know when people opted into that. Simple tool to know, to be able to say, this person's a champion and they agreed with what we're doing. And then from a level three, extend your tooling to provide yearly strategy opt-in per champion. The other thing I wanna do there is I wanna make sure we have management also opting in. I talked about that story earlier where I had to go to uncomfortable meetings and HR was there, which is always uncomfortable when HR is in the meeting. By having that opt-in for the champion and then the manager has to acknowledge it as well, you will never get called into one of those meetings where someone says, well, uh, you said that this employee should do, could do champion stuff and I'm their manager and I said they can't. Hold on. Uh, on October 4th, you opted in last year to give your, your champion here or your employee here the, the permission from you to be a champion. It stops the whole conversation. They, they are bought in. And you know that those champions that are virtually supporting your mission are protected against their manager coming after them because they're trying to do really what's the right thing at the end of the day. And then, you know, executive sponsor buy-in for program vision at level three. Some of this is kind of my perspective. Like I'm a, I don't know, I'm always like, let's start at the bottom, let's do grassroots and let's just, let's rise up whatever we're doing until the executives think it's their idea. And then they come back and, and uh, then say they have this great idea that we're gonna have a champions program. Oh, it's been running for a year, but shh, don't tell, don't tell anybody, I had a good idea. Um, so I'm not, I don't usually like have an idea and say, let's go to the executives and if they agree, then we can, no, start at, I like to start at the bottom. That's why I put executive sponsor buy-in so far down. Here's a couple of examples of program objectives. You know, from an individual perspective, establish a growth pa path for developers to transform into security engineers. That could be your objective right there. That could be what you wanna do with your program. You think more from an organizational perspective, we wanna serve as a leadership and catalyst for secure product development in our SDL because the champions are the ones that can really help you blow that up. Or we wanna be an industry leading program to improve our corporate image. And it could be all of these things together too. The point is set a high level goal that seems insurmountable, like there's no way we could ever do this. Set something, you know, pick a really big goal that people can get behind and go after because people will get behind you in this process. Here's an example of a set of goals that, that towards the end of my time in the Cisco program that I used, specific goals I used that champions opted into. P participating in our champion sessions and monthly meetings. I had to state that because if somebody's not gonna come to my monthly meeting, they're not gonna be a champion for long because that's where that was our main place where we were distilling information and we were doing training and we were you know, getting people excited. Driving adoption of SDL, attain a specific education level. So we had an education program at Cisco. I raised the bar every year for my champions until they were at the highest levels of the security education program that we had. Because I wanted them to be examples inside of their business 
where other people looked at them and said, oh, that's a, someone who's a champion and they're a black belt security. Whoa, I wanna be like that. People will follow that. They will see that's someone I wanna be. And then, you know, in, in different year, one year I focused on threat modeling as one of the security champion goals. I, I had a goal like teach, perform five threat models and teach two people how to do it, something like that. But that, I had, you know, hundreds of champions and that took that goal to heart and we focused on threat modeling a lot in that one year and we made a lot of progress. And the next year we changed it, we did something else. So those are just some examples of goals. Okay, so from a scope perspective here, how deep is the program? So level zero if you're developers only, because I want those product adjacent people that you'll see at level one, my scrum folks, my SREs, DevOps, cloud. Level two is product managers. And level three is executives and managers. I've never cracked level three. I could never get it, I tried, I tried. And when I think about, so I don't, so sometimes this can be confusing because you can look at this and say, well, wait, all these people are together in the same program? No, I had a, a uh, product manager security champion forum going at Cisco. So I could have tailored content to those folks. It was, I did a regular monthly meeting and they were invited to the bigger monthly meeting, but a lot of the things we talked about in the, in the regular monthly meeting were more technical and they, it wasn't maybe as, as applicable to them. But I would have a separate product manager meeting. Talk about things that, are, that, are, that are, they can take action upon. <clears throat> but I never got to the executives and managers. So if you ever do that, please find me wherever I am and send me an email, let me know. Because I'd love to hear, I'd love to see somebody that has a program where they have a, a, maybe it's a quarterly forum for their executives and managers and directors and stuff where you're talking at a much higher level, but you're asking them to help you, you know, take the mission even further. Okay, how about branding? How are you gonna represent this, this group you've built to the bigger company? Level zero, you're not doing any branding. Level one, you've created a name and a tagline for your community. People want something they can get behind from a, you know, they want to, they want a, a, some type of a, you know, a cool name. Like I'm a part of the security ninjas. Ooh, that sounds kind of cool. I'm part, I want to be a part of the security ninjas. And so having that name and tagline, then what happens is every time you go out to the, to the organization, that becomes your, your brand. You know, this is, this is an update coming from the security ninjas to you. Level, with a level two, come up with a visual look and a logo and mascot that goes with it. We're all in sales and marketing here if we're running a champions program, okay? That was a sad day for me. It was about 15, 17 years ago. I was traveling the world <coughs> for Cisco running internal security conferences. And one of my friends at the time, we were having dinner, he looks over and he's like, you know what? We're in sales and marketing. I'm like, shut up. We're not in sales and marketing. Come on, I'm a security engineer. I talk about security. He's like, well, let's look at what we do. We travel around. And we explain to people why security is important for them and how they should get behind it. And we send out communications and I'm like, okay, all right, I'm in sales and marketing. We all are though, right? Like if you're gonna have a champion, successful champions program, you have to do some sales and marketing. You have to sell the, the perspective people who are gonna be working in this program with you. You have to send out communications. You have to be creative with it. So have a, uh, a visual look and a logo mascot along the way. And then level three, if you're, if you're getting swag, Get some swag for your champions. That's why we build a logo and a mascot and stuff so we can print some t-shirts. It's amazing how far a t-shirt will go. What does a t-shirt cost you in bulk? 10 bucks? It's amazing how someone will feel appreciated when you send them a t-shirt that's got this and they'll wear it on, on you know, Zoom calls and people will see, oh, what's that, what's that t-shirt you got there? Oh, that's a Security Ninja t-shirt. Ooh, where do I get that? Like, people will see that and, and your brand will grow. And you'll get to the point where this branding becomes something that everyone in the organization knows. Ooh, that's the security ninjas. Those, those people are really moving security inside our company. Okay, how about recruitment? How are we gonna find and sign up our new champions along the way here? Um, I talked about, this is kind of the same kind of models what I showed you on that previous slide. I think of level one is finding that group of security passionate people. Level two is when it's a mandatory thing. And level three is when you've got real volunteer opt-in where people are chasing you going, I want that t-shirt, how do I get it? Well, you gotta become a security champion. Okay, how about commitment? How much time are your champions spending on security on average? The model that I talk about here, these are not dedicated resources. I'm always slicing, taking slices of individual existing resources in the model that I work with here. And so if you're getting one hour a week, two to four hours a week, or eight hours a week, Level three, eight hours a week, that's, that's where, always where I aimed for. 
that's what would I, I would have as part of my goals for the, the Cisco security advocates was I want eight hours a week from these, these individuals. So that's, that's kind of how the commitment portion works out here. How about communication? You know, so how are you gonna keep everybody else connected to what you're doing from a mission perspective? Level one is just communication with your champions. Level two with the champions direct managers and level three getting to executives. With a, and, and what I mean by that is a tailored message. I don't mean you're just adding the executives to the same messaging that's going out to everybody else. Executives speak a different language. We know this. They, they, they understand return on investment and risk and, and cost and budgets. And so we have to give them a different message that shows the value that the champions are bringing rolled up to something that they can just look at and go, yep, I see the value we're getting out of this, the return on investment here. So updating direct managers, that goes back to the story I told. I also would, whenever a, a champion did something even marginally good, I would send their manager an email and say, oh, I just want to let you know, this person just did this thing, it was really cool. I am just, just want to tell you I'm excited about it. And that would be the end of the email right there. But when it got to review time for that person, they would have a, a slew of emails from me that was highlighting cool things I had seen them do. And they could bring that to the review process and say, well, I'm, I'm doing some cool things here. High level reports, newsletters, you know, creating Slack and Teams channels is a good way to, to build that, especially since we're still primarily in a virtualized kind of world here. We gotta find ways for, for champions to bounce things off each other on a day-to-day -day basis. Okay, so let's talk about the program. What are we gonna offer these folks that, that provides value to them? Everybody, monthly training is, is the big one. Like everybody's, everybody starts there. And you know what? Monthly training is, monthly kind of uh, meeting sessions, they're easy for the first three months. You know what sucks? That fourth month. Because you're like, who the heck am I going to have talk now? I've pretty much gotten everybody that I could find. And so some of the things that I've done to, to uh, fill speakers in those type of slots, one, I built different ways to collect what interesting things champions were doing. And I would just reflect that back and say, hey, Jane, uh, next monthly meeting for November, you're gonna, you need to give me one to three slides on this thing that you did that was so cool because everybody needs to know this. So we had a 15 minute segment of people just quickly sharing cool things and, and encouraging the rest of the teams. The other thing I'll tell you is I used to reach out to people from lots of different organizations, lots of people that I would see speak at conferences and say, hey, will you come and talk to my champions for 30 minutes using something you've already prepared? Meaning you don't have to do any work other than 30 minutes showing up. And I had great success. And, and you can say, oh, well, you were Cisco. And you know, maybe, you're, maybe you're thinking, I'm not Cisco. What I can tell you, though, is like I'm somebody who speaks in the industry quite a bit. If you reach out to me and say, hey, will you come and, and talk to my champions for 30 minutes with something you've already prepared virtually, meaning I don't want you to fly to my location, I'll do it. As long as I can make it align with my schedule, I'll do it. Because you're not really asking me to do that much. Now, if you're like, hey, can you create something original and speak for two hours to my champions? Eh. Now you're talking about I got to spend about 10 hours of my time to 20 hours. And, but for something I've already done and for you know, folks that, that speak at conferences all the time, we've got a number of talks we've already done. Like I can literally just jump on and do a good talk with something I've pre-prepared that'll get your audience excited about it. So don't be afraid to reach out to people and ask. In this industry, we, we, we're too often scared to reach out to people because like, oh, I, don't, I can't even talk to that person. Reach out. This is, everybody's just people here. Like it seems like there's some type of hierarchy. There's really not. Like anybody that speaks at conferences, like you put them in the middle of a football stadium and guess what? Nobody knows who they are. They're like, I don't know. Why is that crazy man in the middle of the stadium down there? <laughs> so level two special training webinars, internal CTF, security days, having special events for, for my champions gets me to a higher level. And then uh, level three internal conferences is, is a big thing. And then I'll tell you about another thing, two things I did with the Cisco program. I, uh, I did a CSSLP, so ISC Squared has a kind of an AppSec focused certification. I took like my 24 top performing champions and I got ma my management team to approve. We just bought a CSSLP virtual class that was six weeks long with an instructor. Those 24 champions were invited and I paid for the, them to take the CSSLP test out of my budget. Guess what? Cost me what? Uh, Forty thousand dollars, maybe at the end of the day. Do you know how much? How much? How much those those champions were excited, ready to take on the whole world inside the company, like they were motivated. 
and it cost me forty thousand dollars which you know that's a lot of money don't get me wrong but in the scheme of cisco's world that was a tiny little drill like you wouldn't even find it on the floor it'd be so small in here <laughs> so but but it but it it those people really felt appreciated in that moment other things that we did there um I went and worked with San Jose State and we created a master's program for our champions and went through and tailored the whole whole setup for them. That, that story is kind of a, another kind of funny experience. So really quickly, I go to uh, this meeting with the folks from San Jose State. I'm prepared to be pitched on the idea. I get there. The, there's all these like professors that have so many letters after their name. I don't even know. You know, I'm very intimidated. And they walk over with the pen and they hand me the marker. And they say, hey, why don't you sketch out on the board what you think would be the best way to solve, to, to serve your people? And I'm like, uh-oh. Uh but luckily the night before I had literally scribbled on a napkin in my hotel room, kind of like what I thought it would be. But I was expecting these, you know, monster academic people to just, you know, have this whole map figured out. And they're like, hey, what do you think we should do? Okay. But two and a half years after we launched it, our first people graduated from it. And I'm excited to say a number of them went on and took other jobs and have moved into security now. They were a developer, they went through that master's degree program, they went and jumped some to other companies. I don't, I mean, it, it was, it's still a powerful thing. Even if they didn't work at the same company anymore, we, that program helped them to grow and change their lives and go down a whole different career path. That's really what this is about, right? It's not about me. It's about how can I help these people get somewhere further down the road. Okay, coaching. This is a relatively new one for me. I was talking on the AppSec podcast to a guy who works in a large financial in Pennsylvania. And he's the one who, uh, who, who really taught me this whole concept of coaching. What he had done is he brought in effectively life coaches for security on his team. He had a few of them. And what they would do is they would jump in and work with developers at, just for a short period of time. And then they would, they would kind of move on to the next person. Maybe they were helping them learn how to threat model. They were working through a design problem. They were trying to show them some secure coding tips or whatnot. But they had taken, he had taken this coaching idea and I thought, you know what, this is, this is gonna become part of what I recommend going forward because it's a really powerful connection point to people. And so with level one, you've got volunteer coaches within your champions. Two, you've got staffed coaches. You've got people on your team that are prepared to be those security life coaches. And three, you've got coaches that are dedicated to different parts of the business that are really out there. And their goal is to really work mostly with the champions, but also other developers along the way. Education, I think champions and education programs have to be interwoven. There has to be a connection here. Because one, the education program is a feeder for my champions. If I have someone start with the company and six months later, they've gone through four levels of my security training and I don't know who they are, guess what? I'm gonna send them an email and say, you need to be a security champion because you just spent uh, probably 50 hours of your own time learning about security inside of our training platform. So I, want, I like to see these two things interwoven. So level one, um, your ad hoc security training. Level two, you've got regular security training for all your champions. Level three, you've got hackathons, build it, break it, fix it, contests, all kinds of things that are from that educational perspective. And thanks to the uh, DevSecOps maturity model of the OWASP project, I was struggling with how to, to put together this list for this particular item. And I looked in DSOM and this is what uh, Timo had put into the DSOM uh, to cover this, to cover the education side. And I liked what he did, so I borrowed it. Okay, retention, how are we gonna keep them coming back for more? So one, simple retention being, let's just send some messages to them. Let's encourage them throughout their time as, as champions. Level two, you need to tap into your existing rewards system. So inside your companies, you have some HR focused rewards program. Nobody ever uses it for the most part. Become the biggest consumer of that program. So at Cisco, the HR team would put aside 10% of a team's salary into a fund for cap awards, like for, for on the spot type of awards and stuff like that. And guess what? Nobody ever used them. So the money would sit there and at the end of the quarter, it would get peeled off and put back into the general fund or whatever. I found a way to tap into it. So I would, I would tell the manager, hey, send this person a reward, please. You know it's coming out of the cap fund, so it's not costing you any money. You already got the money and you're not using it. Kind of guilt them a little bit into it. And I became the biggest driver of money going out of that fund. I literally gave away millions, even though I never did one. It was just encouraging people. 
But that was an existing rewards program that existed. You know, you could, you could, um, you, it, I wasn't create. I didn't have to go ask for budget or something. And the budget was there. People just weren't using it. And then three, if you get to that level three, get your own budget for rewarding people. That's a powerful thing. Imagine being able to say, these folks here are the 10 champions that have just been kicking butt this year. I'm sending y'all to Black Hat on my, out of my budget. I'm paying for your travel, I'm paying for your conference, I'm sending you to a three-day training there. You wanna talk about some excited people that'll go to, go to battle for you in the future, plus you're still meeting that goal of leveling up and helping them, helping them grow. A lot of things you can do from a re retention perspective. You know, we talked about a few of these, you know, um, but public recognition is a big thing, recognizing people at, in their management structures, um, T-shirts, stickers, team, Slack messages, certificates, whatever you got to do. There's a lot of things. There's a lot of ideas you can use from a retention perspective. So just two more items in the framework here. Metrics and measurement. How do we demonstrate program ROI? So for me, level one is about just doing basic metrics. How many champions do we have? What's our distribution across business units and product? What's the levels of education in the education program that these folks have done? And then what's the flaw density? How can I compare these champions against other developers or other people in different functions to see how they're doing? Are they doing better or worse than other people you know, in the same job role? From an intermediate perspective, I wanna see this thing called an ENPS. I don't know about you, I just learned about this at the Open Security Summit. Um, about a month or two ago. And I'd never heard of an idea of an employee net promoter score. But you, this is something you can send. It's a, I didn't come up with it. It's someone else was explaining it to me and I was like, wow, that would be a cool thing to send to my champions to see, are, do my champions feel like they wanna invite other people to be champions? And, and that's an interesting metric to watch because if they uh, you know, are scoring a 9.6 or something out of 10, I know I'm feeding them with the right stuff, rewards, recognition, opportunities. If, if it's below six, I probably got some work to do. And then the third metric there, or third level, action-based. Are you taking action based on the metrics and measurements that you have? Are you changing the, the, the things that you do? Do you have that ability to do that? <coughs> okay, last one, globalization. How do you build a program if you're a worldwide company? At Cisco, I had gigantic offices in Bangalore, I had Shanghai, um, I had Amsterdam, and then I had East and West Coast US, and then um, a few other places sprinkled around the world. So from a globalization perspective, level one, schedule in a comfortable way for global citizens. What I mean by that is don't schedule the meeting at 8 a.m. or you know, 7 a.m. Eastern time, or even 8 a.m. Eastern time, because it's five o'clock in California and it might be you know, uh, try to find the opportune time for your entire audience is what I'm saying here. There's a timeanddate.com meeting planner. It's a website. I use it all the time when I'm trying to connect people and find the right time for a meeting. Uh, for level two, have a local time and event. Schedule an event for those local, for the folks. I used to do an India time, um, a time, I used to do a separate champions meeting towards the end of my time for my folks in Bangalore and China and whatnot. It would be, it would start at midnight East Coast time, but I'd have 150 people on the line. So yes, was it, was it uh, uh, you know, not as easy for me? Of course. But was I, you know, have, was I making 150 people have to deal with a crappy time where they live, like in early evening family time? No. So I, I just sucked it up. It was once a month, 12 till 1.30 in the morning. I slept in the next day. But those people appreciated the fact that, that they were not having to, like they always had to do for everything else, which was meet in the times that were not ideal for them, ideal for the people in the US. And then level three, put boots on the ground. You gotta have some people there. If you're gonna be level three, you gotta put people in your global sites that are from your security team that are leading those champions. And you're almost creating sub teams of champions that are doing their own thing locally on their time zones and, and being encouraged there. So if you run all these scores up, there's three levels on each of these, 36 possible points, 12 areas. These are just my ideas. Zero to 14, you've got room to grow. 15 to 23, you're making some progress. And 24 plus, you're on that way to that world-class type of a program. I'll make the slides available. You can dig into this as much as you want from a program assessment perspective. But I just, I just made up some numbers based on programs I've seen, just so you could see kind of how the numbers would roll out. You know, a, a, one that's striving um, was at about the 20 and a half. An excellent one was 33. And somebody that I know that was failing was, I would count them as a four, according to this model. 
but you can dig into that more with the slides. So here we are wrapping it up, applying this. You know, if you've got a, a security community, champions or whatnot, I would recommend assessing where you are against the framework. Try to see, try to see how what you're doing fits in. First three months, pick a couple of these actions and try to raise the raise your level. That's why I wrote it the way I did here. It's like you can create a, you can do a just in time, here's where we are in assessment. You can also do a future looking roadmap to say, here's some things we want to do to improve our program. Okay, there's a picture of the framework again and my key takeaways. So think about what you're providing for those champions, what's in it for them. I've said it about 10 times. I'll say it 10 more times if I have to, because that's one of the most important things. Make it about them. Find the areas in the framework there that, that you need to improve as you build out the program. Do that plan of action and just know that your company needs champions. It's, it's really gonna provide a huge amount of value. I've seen this be revolutionary in so many different places. And with that, I've saved, they said I had the room the rest of the day, so I've got two hours for questions available here. So that's my contact information as well. I'm always happy to talk champions, threat modeling, almost anything in the world of AppSec. But what do we got as far as uh, questions? I'll even say, I'm gonna say something dangerous here. Questions, comments. Yeah, please. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's great. I mean, the question was that she's seen some uh, some champions who really don't want to progress to be an engineer. They just like being a champion. That's awesome. Like, I don't have any problem with that. I want them to have the opportunity to progress, but I need a good core group of people that are going to be solid champions throughout the lifetime of the program. So I don't see that as a negative at all. At all. I want them to feel like they always have a role and they're continuing to grow, even though they want to continue in what they're doing from a development perspective. Yeah. In monthly meetings and covering different subjects during each meeting, can you give an idea of what like, the course progression would look like for half a year or so? Like what you do for the first month and the second month? So you want an easy way. OWASP top ten. Sure. Number one, we talk about that the first <laughs> first month. Number two, you know, we go so you got ten week ten months of meetings right there alone. There's other things in OWASP. There's the proactive controls. That's 10, <laughs> 10 things. So you've got some, a lot of content in the world of OWASP you can use. Um, what I used to do is I would aim to have an external speaker for 20 to 30 minutes. So somebody that I had seen at a conference somewhere and just uh, often I'd walk up to them after and say, hey, would you come and, and do a <laughs> talk to my champions? Uh, so I would aim to have a segment with uh, an external speaker. If I didn't have that, I'd have an internal person sometimes fill that in as well. So, but there's a lot of OWASP pieces you can use to, to have a, a bundle of, of focused content for a period of time. Yeah. It's open source. There's no open source label on it yet. I just made that decision. It's going to be open source. I might, I'm thinking about making it an OWASP project. I'm trying to figure out if that could be a vehicle to, uh, to store it so, every, so it'd be bigger than me. Other people could contribute to it as well. Cool. All right, well, thanks, everybody. Have a good uh, rest of the time at LastCon.